Hello, everyone. Welcome. Michael Monty's here. This is exciting. He's Champlain Housing Trust CEO, having joined the leadership team in 2007 and appointed CEO in January 2021. He has over 40 years of community and economic development experience, both at the nonprofit and municipal level. He worked at Burlington's Community and Economic Development Office, CEDO, from its creation and was its long-serving director. Prior to CEDO, he was employed as executive director for several nonprofit organizations, including the King Street Center. Michael is also a founder and partner of the Independent Community Development Consultant Group, Burlington Associates, where he worked with community and land trusts around the country. He serves on the board of the National Neighbor Works Association, the Grounded Solutions Network, and leads the CEO Forum of the Housing Partnership Network. He's the chair of HPLEX, a national insurance captive that provides workers the comp, health care, and property and liability insurance to members of the Housing Partnership Network. Michael is a recipient of the Con Hogan Award for Creative Entrepreneurial Community Leadership and has been recognized for his work by the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board with the Molly Beatty Award. Michael is a graduate of Achieving Excellence, a leadership program of Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and NeighborWorks America. He holds a BA degree from Goddard College. Please welcome Michael Monty. About. Um, so thank you for uh, being here. I'm very happy, uh, and it's great to be able to speak to so many of you. Um, I, I will go through some slides, but I really, you know, I, I'll take questions earlier. I hope that's okay. Nobody gets in. I don't, no, no, no. Okay, you hold your questions then, but I'll try to end a little early, because I like dialogue. I think information, get, Oh, okay. oh yes, yeah, okay, that's fine. But I, but I'm, I'm more, more, I'm more inclined to understand what you need to know, and by asking questions, I'll get that. So I'll do my best to move through these, and not to bore you too much with the presentation. How are we doing with this? Is this good? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So, I am the CEO of Champlain Housing Trust. I have been working there for about 15 plus or so years. Uh, you, saw, you heard the introduction. I've been the CEO for the last few years, actually starting being the CEO during COVID. And so I'm going to give you a little presentation. Oh, come on. Now you're supposed to move. Huh? Not going. Excuse me? One more time. Hey. Okay. So uh, just to say that we, um, this is our mission statement. Uh, we do permanently affordable housing. That's the work we do. Uh, and uh, we've been uh, around since uh, 1984 doing that work. We're, we're a result of a merger of two co companies that got established in 1984, Lake Champlain Housing Development Corporation and the Burlington Community Land Trust. Um, everything we do is permanently affordable. We are governed by a 15-member board. We are a membership organization. I would hope that some of you are members. It doesn't cost you anything. Oh, it costs you a dollar uh, or more if you want. Um, but certainly as a membership organization, we respond to membership, but we respond to the community. All our residents are members. And a third of our residents sit on the board. Uh, so we're constantly getting feedback from our, the people who live uh, in our properties. Um, we, are, we provide housing on a continuum. We don't do one kind of housing. Uh, and though we really work from homelessness to home ownership and everything in, bet everything in between and little bits and pieces of each of those types of things uh, if, if, I, if, if I could sort of maybe do a little iterative about each stuff. So a lot of different kinds of work in homelessness, a lot of different kinds of rental housing. Home ownership is principally the shared equity model, but we do a lot of counseling and education and support for people who simply want to be homeowners in the regular market. So a really range of kinds of services uh, that we're providing in the community. Here's, here's our numbers uh, to get you a sense of who we are in terms of uh, sort of scale. We're probably the largest nonprofit, certainly in Vermont. We're probably one of the uh, few of the largest in New England, um, certainly not in the country. Um, uh, but we are a decent number of apartments, shared equity homes, we have a range of different kinds of commercial spaces. 
uh, five different kinds of loan programs, which I'll give you more description of those as well. Um, and an operating budget of $29 million, which does not include all the development work that we wind up doing, nor some of the partnership properties that we actually own. And 151 staff, so not a small organization uh, by, by any means. We just won, um, or we will be one of the best places to work uh, in Vermont, and we are actually, the, over the last 15 years, the second largest growing company in Vermont um, for under a certain number. So I, um, I'm not sure uh, our growth was necessary. Uh, um, it's unfortunate in some ways, but also it's good that we'll be able to meet the need uh, in the community. Here's what we did in 2023 in terms of the total number of things. You see some of the same information, total number of apartments, total shared equity homes, um, some new buyers in our shared equity program, uh, two point, almost $3 million in lending of different kinds of loan products, which I'll describe a little bit. Um, we have a very robust resident services department who are providing services to our residents in terms of supporting them. Um, so you, you can see, see what else is up here. Um, Two hundred and one new new renters who had been previously unhoused uh, that were housed over the last year. Right now, we have about five hundred or so plus people who were pre who were previously unhoused who are living in our rental apartments. But again, a diverse portfolio. Okay, uh, so a different range of different kinds of things, not just one thing. So five different kinds of shelters that we're operating. We're actually the biggest shelter provider in the state of Vermont. We go from a motel, which we operate at Harbor Place, all the way to um, the pods in Burlington, uh, to actually just owning property on behalf of nonprofits. So steps to end domestic violence. We bought the building for them. We rent it to them for very as little as possible, and they run their program out of our property. And we make sure the property is good and, uh, and works for them. So we we have a wide different kinds of relationships in terms of the how on, um, um, homeless uh, work that we do. Or supportive housing homes, these are group homes, uh, different kinds of supports going on within the properties. 13 group homes in special purpose housing. Um, we have hundred, almost 1,800 affordable apartments, plain vanilla old apartments. Um, seven co-ops and resident controlled properties, 458 apartments. These are, these, are, these are apartments which are organized by the residents to self-manage. Three mobile home parks, and community facilities and commercial uh, sort of uh, spaces. So um, if you're familiar with downtown Burlington and City Hall across the street, that little range of the Mad River drinking place and the wine shop and the hairstylist, those are our places. <laughs> we, we rent those out uh, to folks. We also do the Old North End Community Center. We're about to buy the O'Brien Community Center in, Ch in, 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 Will in Winooski and improve that. So we do community facilities like the food shelf and, uh, and uh, child care centers all the way to sort of typical uh, market kind of stuff. So I, I was asked to talk about a handful of topics and so I'm a little bit all over the place so help me. I'll, I'll try to give you some description. See what, these are some of the, what we see is some of the ma macro market forces right now causing I think probably the most difficult affordable housing environment we've seen uh, in Chittenden County or in Vermont in decades. Um, there is a large immigration to, in migration to Vermont. Uh, a few years ago, if I went to somebody, one of the private developers would have said, so uh, how are s rental sales go? And they would say, great. Um, and they would have maybe 10 or 15% of the people who are asking them about apartments uh, to be from out of state. Now it's 50%. Okay, now it's very large numbers who want to move to Vermont. Why is that? Because people can work from home. Uh, and you could live anywhere. Two houses on my street, which is just a one street, sold to people who, uh, one, one couple works in London and New York City, when they're not living in Charlotte Street in Burlington. Um, uh, the other couple actually just moved back, but owned something in North Carolina. And we're happy to be back in Burlington because it was a better place to live, okay? Uh, so those are, those are some of the macro forces in terms of the jobs and employment uh, activities that are going on right now in the marketplace. That's driving prices up. 
deep in prices, both in sales and home sales, and in rent increases. Very low vacancy, it's a healthy vacancy rate is 5%. The vacancy rate now in Burlington is about 1%. Okay, it was actually 0.5%, which means it didn't exist, which means that there was really no vacancy. When an apartment became available, just when the survey happened, it was empty by chance. Not that there was, in fact, a healthy vacancy. Vacancy rate has gone up a little bit, um, but not quite where it needs to be. Increased interest rates are causing both the developers of affordable housing, developers of private sector housing, and homeowners to simply have housing out of reach. Uh, it used to cost us, I just looked at this recently, um, the, uh, well, that's, it's the next, it's actually a higher construction cost, but uh, the increase, uh, this is what I want to talk about, the higher construction costs are also a factor, uh, somewhat inflation, but certainly just labor and materials. Um, so we built uh, 74 units of housing for $20 million and now costs us $22 million to build 40 units of housing. So the co construction costs and the cost of everything is so much substantially higher uh, that it becomes difficult really for, this is true of private sector, but also certainly in terms of what we have to do. Uh, rise of short-term rentals is an issue. It's a major issue in uh, Burlington or in, in, in the county and in Vermont. There's a statistic, which I don't know if it's uh, true anymore, but it's likely true that if you wanted to house all the homeless people in San Francisco, you just put them over in an Airbnb and they'd be all, be all set. There's enough housing that's come out of the market, in other words, rental housing that's come out of the market to, to create the Airbnbs that has caused an impact overall in terms of the availability of housing for anybody. And then we're going to be seeing some significant property tax increases in the horizon, which is going to create, I think, some difficulties for everyone. Um, so this is what's the, these are some of the factors that are influencing the most vulnerable. Um, a larger number of displacement occurring due to high, rising rents. We see actually people being kicked out of their homes because the landlord can raise the rent by $500 or $700 um, a month. Uh, we've seen that happen in terms of redevelopment. Uh, occurring in different parts of the, this county where, where properties are being uh, eliminated, uh, torn down, and new housing is being built because the cost of the, the demolition, the construction, um, um, gives, uh, the, gives it the owner a chance to make a lot more money on such increased rents. Um, higher numbers of mental health issues and substance abuse issues. A little bit of the trauma that coming out of whatever happened in COVID, but certainly much more um, intense uh, than it ever has been. In 2020, when we uh, and see at Sampling Housing Trust, we had two people who would do, three people who would do resident services, support for individuals in our properties. We now have 15 people uh, who do that. We've increased the number of people supporting people in our properties. They're not doing counseling and therapy. They're simply trying to assist them uh, to uh, get them through uh, the, the, uh, the regular work, uh, the regular day. Uh, a lack of shelter options. And so there's hundreds of people now who don't have any shelter uh, right now. And starting in the next month or two with the motel program ending at the state of Vermont, there'll be a lot more people also still on the street. For me, I don't see a comprehensive treatment program out there. There are some, but they're not strong enough. And the drugs have changed. Um, I could tell you that the kinds of drugs that existed 10 or 15 years ago and the kind of modalities and the, sort of re and the, and the responses to those kinds of drugs 10 or 15 years ago were much more straightforward in terms of what people could do in terms of substance abuse disorder. The kinds of drugs that are out there right now are just so different. Um, it, it, I don't know if you really want to go down this path, but uh, heroin costs a decent amount of money. You did a, her you did a fix of heroin and you're a good for the day. Uh, fentanyl costs like 50 cents. It's good for a couple hours, but you need a lot of it. And it's destructive in every way. And there's not really a good way to get off of it. And when you mix it with methadrine, which is uh, speed, or crystal meth, and you, mi and you mix it with a couple of other drugs that people are mixing it with, it's deadly. Um, and so the, 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 this has occurred over the last three to five years. Um, and it's brand new, I think, overall uh, to society. 
Um, you know that staffing at social service agencies is at a difficult level. They're having, people are having a hard time finding the people they need to be able to sort of do the work because it's hard work. And then overall community safety has declined. Um, we, we know that that's in part because of um, a, a response to the need of people needing to be housed. The number of people who are on the street who are struggling and who are looking to do um, some kind of damage in the community has increased as a result of all this. Um, I guess I'm not going to tell you that. I, well, I will say that the state has been very positive and responsive over the last few years, in part because of COVID funds, uh, but also um, um, overall seeing the, the greater need that's out there. And I think they still want to be responsive, and we believe that, in fact, over the next few years, there's going to be a sort of continued support from the state of Vermont to do more. Um, Pre-COVID, there would be um, an allocation to the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, which was the principal source of funding for affordable housing. That allocation would be $15 million, half of which had to go to conservation. So we're talking about $8 million, OK? Um, I can't do anything. We can't do anything with $8 million anymore. And uh, the number, the dollar amounts that were spent in the state of Vermont were more like $100 million. And that was really just being able to keep, keep up. And so that allocation over years uh, has not quite been enough in order to be able to sustain the need for greater affordable housing. Again, factors such as Airbnbs, in migration, higher interest rates, higher cost, all of those factoring into the fact that the need is even greater and the appropriation was so less little over a decade prior to uh, COVID uh, has created a sort of a, um, a bit of a crisis. Um, we are, there is a policy activity now going on in the state of Vermont around and eliminating single family zoning and pursuing Act 250 reforms. It's fine. Um, we're all um, basically for that, um, but it, it really is just a it really is just a small move. Uh, it's going to maybe save some time and cost, but it's not going to be substantial enough to really just sort of change the dynamic we have in front of us. Um, but we, so um, as you can see, we've been very busy, uh, and we have lots of new properties in, uh, coming online. And so Post Apartments is in downtown Burlington. It's at the former VFW building. I'm going to tear that down and put 38 apartments focusing on veterans with a ground floor for a community justice center. Cambrian Rise, which is a thousand unit development that's on North Avenue. We've done 60, 74 uh, rental units. We're going to be doing another 30, uh, four, another 40 rental units and 30 home ownership units there as well. Bay Ridge, which is in Shelburne, is going to be another combination of rental and affordable uh, home ownership. Um, ride Your Bike Hula. And what is Ride Your Bike Hula? It sounds like funny. Um, so this is the South End, which is, um, for those of you who um, are dated uh, or as old as me, uh, General Electric, General Dynamics, all of that property, that's Ride Your Bike Hula, OK? Uh, a thousand units being planned uh, for that area, which will include uh, some rental housing, some home ownership. Working on, on getting uh, with the city of Winooski on getting the armory uh, to be able to become uh, uh, rental proper properties in, in, um, in Winooski. And again, in ho our home ownership pipeline is again Ride Your Bike Cooler, Bay Ridge, Heinsburg. Uh, we got some development uh, planned. Uh, and we work closely with Habitat for Humanity. Um, everything, uh, all the Habitat for Humanity homes become part of our portfolio, and we work with them closely. Um, I'm going to come back for this. Somebody told me that you wanted to know what we're going to do with $20 million, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who why do, we'll come back to that. Um, here's a picture of Post Apartments in, Shelburne, in uh, downtown Burlington. Uh, this is a photo of Bay Ridge in, um, in Shelburne, which is the former Harbor Place site. The motel you see actually the ones furthest that way, those are home ownership. This one over here is rental. Uh, so it's like a dual use. Six acres of land that are going to be redeveloping. A lot of support from town. This is Cambrian Rise. Jesus, look at that. Holy. Oh, I can move around, can I? Um, this is not, so you know, from, you're familiar with North Avenue? This is not built yet. 
No, right? We own this one over here. Um, this is Cathedral Square. Um, this has been developed over here. Uh, that's SD Ireland. So, so you know, if you want to buy a $1.8 million home at the top of that floor of SD Ireland, you could do that. That's all it costs. Starts at a million. Goes up to 1.8. Or you could rent there for $4,500 a month, $5,000 a month. That's the pricing for that particular property. We're going to be building here. That'll be, again, 40 shared equity, uh, 30 shared equity homes and 30 apartments. Our rents will be about, this is probably going to sound high to you as well, uh, but $1,100 for one bedroom, including all utilities. Uh, our homes will be selling for $170,000, $175,000. So that's what we do when we do the affordable housing part of that redevelopment. Uh, this is in Heinsberg. And Heinsberg has got a mix of uses. We'll have a child care center way, way over there. Um, we'll have some single family homes being built by a private developer. We'll have some habitat homes in here as well. And we'll do some, also some mixed use multifamily rental and some ownership as well. So it's a mixed use development. This is land that was donated to us uh, by Jan from NRG, former owner of NRG. Um, again, we do a lot of service enriched housing. Um, this is just showing you some of the, we, bought, we, have, we have purchased 10 motels over the last 10 years, a pile of them during COVID. This was one of them. This is the former Handy Suites, right, um, which we then converted into the new Steps to End Domestic Violence Shelter. They really had a little house, a little house, it's a big house, on Colchester Avenue, but that's all they had. This, is, this was formerly 30. Suites, it is now 21 suites, meaning full kitchens and bedrooms and all that, plus their offices, all in one location. And, they, and we rent it, basically we were able to get the money to buy the whole thing outright, do all the renovations, and we own it, and they just are paying for the carrying costs of it. They have, actually have an option to purchase this from us for practically nothing in five years uh, when they choose to do it. In the meantime, they're very happy that we're sitting there with a full maintenance staff ready to, to support them uh, when they need some uh, help and assistance. Here are the pods, okay, 32 individual pods, scheduled to be out of existence in two years. We'll see uh, how that works. Um, a lot of the folks who are at the pods uh, have um, substance abuse disorder. They're working through it. Um, we have uh, placed a, just a handful of folks now in permanent housing, it's been a struggle. Let me just dial back. We have um, a whole bunch of apartments to rent to people. We give certain preferences and different properties to homeless folks. Um, we have about 3,000 applications every year for 300 or so apartments that might be available. Okay? Not all, all those folks wind up with us. They, need, they may go someplace else, or they may find some other alternatives. Um, so we have a waiting list now, a waiting list, and we don't wait, uh, some waiting list, but we have a waiting time of about 15 months. Okay, that's how long it takes to get into one of our properties. Sometimes there's some preferences and people can move faster, but often enough it takes a long time to get affordable housing. So when we started the pods, when the idea of us doing the pods started, our waiting times were less. Uh, it was more like six months. Uh, and the notion was we were going to be able to move people out more quickly. It's taking longer. In the meantime, the, the people who are there are doing way better. Um, and they're not on the street, and they're actually surviving uh, well and beginning to build the skills they need in order to be uh, housed well. Uh, this is, oh, this is one of the motels we, 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 um, we renovated. Um, Brayburn is... Um, we bought two ho-hums. Uh, we bought the ho-hum one on Williston Road and one ho-hum on Shelburne Road. This is the one on Williston Road. Uh, during COVID, we operated 32 rooms, which was the COVID isolation and quarantine facility for the state of Vermont. Anybody who needed to have a shelter or be quarantined came to the ho-hum two on Williston Road. We operated that. And then we have um, now that program ended and we have converted them into 20 apartments. 
uh, with support and services. Uh, converting those old roadside motels is actually pretty, um, I'm going to say easy, it's not, but it's pretty, pretty straightforward. You have two doors, you block up one door, you put a door in between the two rooms, you turn the bathroom into a kitchen, and then you have basically a 600 square foot single, single, bed, uh, single bed apartment, which we could rent pretty cheaply, and which actually is way, way less expensive uh, to build than building brand new. Um, we have 20, oh, and that's not the right number, 34 beds that are recovery housing, working for the Foundations of Recovery, uh, for recovery, and that group is basically making sure that people who are, uh, um, have gone past a part of addiction disorder are now in recovery, have a program and a place to live. And that is in um, Fort Ethan Allen. We bought 21 apartments in Fort Ethan Allen from the University of Vermont. We saved three of the larger buildings. This is one of them. And the other 18 we turned into home ownership. Oh. This is the Old North End Community Center. We do community centers. Um, the Old North End Community Center is um, the one over here on that side. See it? Uh, that, this front door. If, you, if you've been in Burlington and you needed to go to a child care center or Very Merry Theater or Pickleball or something else, you've gone to the Old North End Community Center. It's become a great community center for, um, for, for the Old North End. It used to be, oh, Jesus, for, former, anybody? Cool. What, what was the name of it, though? No. Nazareth. No. <laughs> no, I can't remember. All right, that, anyway, we turned that old school uh, into um, a, a great community center. It has the Association for Africans Living in Vermont. Sandy, you have an office there. Yeah. I know what it says up there, but that's just, that's just old Catholics. I'm an old Catholic, so that's just old Catholic stuff, yeah. <laughs> But next to it is the O'Brien Community Center, which is, was done 15 years ago, uh, which had uh, community health centers of Burlington and a few other uses there. Uh, but we've been asked to buy the property from the city of Winooski, which we're going to do, and to expand the level of community health activities and, dent and dental clinic at that location, create a new library, a brand new library, if the city of Winooski doesn't have a really, really good library. Uh, and then to do an event hall on the top with a community kitchen and some nonprofit office space. Um, here, I'm running out of time. I want to get back to tell you how we're spending all that money. Um, here are the number of uh, different kinds of loan programs we have. Uh, again, about three to four million dollars each year uh, is going out in different loans. Um, many of them are operating within Northwest Vermont, but some of these are statewide, like the mobile home lending program and the farm worker housing program are two programs we operate uh, uh, statewide. Um, very successful and really over 100 people, over 100 loans over the last year or so. Um, I don't know if you know what shared equity is, but we basically take a home, we make an investment. And in exchange for that investment and money coming from us, the family gets to buy the home from us. But when they sell it, they can't sell it and take all the money back and keep it. We keep it within the home. And basically, it's called shared equity. So if they buy a home, we sell somebody a home for $175,000. Usually means it's appraised at $350,000 in the market. If it appreciates to $450,000, that extra $100,000, they keep, they keep 25% of that, okay? And also all the mortgage payment they made plus all the improvements they made to the house. But we get to keep it, the rest of it and make sure that it's affordable to the next generation. This is called permanent affordable housing, home ownership model that is basically becoming even more popular now across the United States as a way to ensure that there is permanently affordable home ownership opportunities for people in neighborhoods where they don't exist. Am I, what is all that? Oh, and this is telling all the great things about shared equity, yeah. Um, I think that's it. Now let's see if I can go back to, oh, I've got to go through all that. This is great TV, isn't it? Um, now did I get to... There we go, Mackenzie Scott gift. 
So uh, I'll tell you a story about how we got a Mackenzie Scott gift. Because I have never met her. I have never spoken to her. I have not even exchanged a word with Mackenzie Scott ever. Um, the McKen uh, Mackenzie Scott, if you know, is the former um, wife of Jeff Bezos who decided to take her uh, divorce settlement and give it away. <laughs> uh, that's the best way of describing it. Um, uh, she has been giving monies, funds away for the last few years on a regular basis. Um, and the good thing about what she does is when she gives the money away, she says, here, go ahead. Do good work. Um, don't have to report to us. Don't come back. This, uh, um, and it's yours to spend on the work that you've done. Um, we had no idea that this, this gift was underway. Okay. Um, the story, the story is that we as an organization, uh, the Champlain Housing Trust, act on a national level as well. We're engaged in, I think in my, my bio there, talked about different national organizations that we are part of. So we're known across the United States for a variety of different kinds of programs. Um, as Mackenzie Scott was looking at different um, opportunities, our name kept on showing up. But we didn't know that. We got a call in February of last year, not this recent February, last year, uh, which was, uh, hey, we represent a, a group of donors. Uh, we'd like to talk to you about what you do, what you do. Do you mind if you have an hour? We'd love to spend some time with you. And I said, sure, me and Chris Donnelly, who works on community relations, and we got on the phone, or Zoom, and these people were sitting around a table in San Francisco, and we were just chatting about our work, and we talked for about an hour. They said, do you, uh, we have some questions. Would you be able to answer some questions in paperwork? So we said, sure. So we send them all the stuff we usually send people around our audits and our financial plans and strategic plans and all that other stuff that good organizations do. Um, I sent them a couple of other emails. Hey, you know what? I forgot to tell you this. I forgot to tell you that. Months go by. Um, uh, we just thought, God, who is that? We, didn't know, we really didn't know who it was. It could have been anybody. Um, and uh, I think I was at a conference in um, Newburgh uh, or a gathering in Newburgh, New York, with other NeighborWorks organizations where a NeighborWorks member. And I got, a f I got an email that said, hey, do you have some time over the next couple of days to chat about um, a potential gift? I said, sure. And I went, ooh. <laughs> I got a little chill. Um, I said, OK, yeah, like right away uh, or tomorrow. So I'm at a motel room, and this person gets on the phone and said, Michael, I want to tell you that Mackenzie Scott has decided to give you $20 million. I said, oh. <laughs> it was pretty startling, um, frankly. And it kind of like just shook me a little bit. I got teary-eyed. I get teary-eyed somehow just <laughs> thinking about what a, what, a, what a gift it was. Um, so what we had to then. What, amazingly enough, as soon as she said that, um, I put together a little email and told my, tell our staff and said, of course, you have to keep this quiet. But, and I, I'm, I kind of wrote this up. Um, more or less, we, uh, if you ask me right now, how would you spend $15 million? I could tell you. you know? uh, if you ask any organization that's active doing work and you say, hey, how would you spend they should be able to tell you how they spend $10 million. They should be able to tell you how they'll spend $20 million. It was pretty, pretty quick. Our, our eternal joke, I probably shouldn't say this out loud. Um, our eternal joke was, if only it was 25. <laughs> it would be perfect. Um, so well, let me just describe to you how we, how we, um, how we um, put this, uh, this pile of money together in, in different ways. Well, uh, probably in, 19, uh, in 2004, um, Lois McClure and others raised an endowment for CHT. Uh, Brenda Torpy was very, very much in leadership of that, raised a couple of million dollars. At a time when CHT's budget was $6 million, that was enormous, right? The amount of money that an endowment provides in terms of regular cash was great. As I told you, we were, it used to be six, that was six million then. It is now $29 million now. And so we were thinking our endowment needed to grow uh, and be a little bit more. Now, endowments are just not cash sitting around not doing anything, right? For an organization that is in real estate, we are required to have money. 
you probably all know, you look seasoned enough. Seasoned enough. The only people who give you, uh, the only reason you get money is if you have money. Nobody's giving money to anybody who doesn't have it. You have to show as an organization that you're strong, that you have the capacity to manage uh, the properties, that you have the potential, the capacity to manage debt. And so for us, we actually needed to have more money sitting in a bank uh, to be there to ensure our um, grantors, the banks who were lending us money, everybody, that in fact we were in good financial health. We weren't in bad financial health, but uh, knowing that we needed to grow endowment was something that was in our mind. So we put $6 million more into that endowment fund. And that means that have, we have an $8 million endowment. So what is it doing? It's generating money. It's generating about last year, generated about six or $700,000. And where are we putting it? Into resident services. Because nobody's giving us money uh, to do support for residents. Like, we could, when we do development, we can get rental income. When we do loans, we could charge a little fee. But nobody's giving anybody money for resident services. And so we immediately put it into resident services. Essentially, those, that cash flows back to CHT to support its resident services program. Um, Lyft is basically strategic investments in property. Um, we have used Lyft pro monies to uh, buy Dorset Commons, which is in South Burlington. We, basically, it is an internal fund that allows us to carry low debt on a property that we may need to build, uh, to, bu to buy, and redevelop. Um, we have used Lyft, we have invested more money in Lyft, and we're using, we have used it to lend money to properties that we have taken over or control to help those properties be more successful. There's still some money left in there, we spent some of that. Working capital. We do about $60 million worth of development every year. And often enough, there's a need to invest a certain amount of money early on. And so $2.5 million in sort of working capital, uh, which is very important. And then community centers. The old North End Community Center had some debt that was coming up in the next few years that we had to pay off, which we were going to go out and raise money for. We paid that off early. Um, the O'Brien Center, we're going to be buying that building from the city of Winooski. And we're going to be using some of the money to reinvest in that building as well. That's the community center part. On the one, those are what I would call ongoing investments. In other words, they're going to go into properties, or they're going to go into endowments, and they're going to generate income or positive cash for us. The one-time investments are a little bit more uh, interesting. Um, Home ownership equity program is a program that we have initiated a couple of years ago, which is down payment assistance for people of color to buy homes. I can go into a long description of that if you want to, but basically the number of folks who have been able to buy homes who are, people who are, who are uh, black or African American uh, is, is so low in this compared uh, to white homeowners in the state of Vermont and across the country. We have provided $25,000 of a very quick loan that disappears within a few years. Uh, through something called the Special Purpose Credit Program. And we have funded that in Chittenden County, Northwest Vermont, through a generous grant from the New England Federal Credit Union of $3 million, which we got a couple of years ago. And that's money that's being dispersed to individual homeowners. Um, what we did with this $1 million is we said, let's make it available statewide to our nonprofit partners across the state of Vermont. So basically, this is funding a statewide homeownership equity program across the state. Uh, community building and engagement is just that, when we see little opportunities where we could invest some monies to do some work where we know we could build community within our properties or outside our properties, uh, it's there. And that's true of the special initiatives and uh, the stewardship fund. Those, these are monies that we expect to be spending and not getting back uh, uh, at all. So that's the profile of the, the $20 million. And I think I'm going to stop there uh, because we have 20, uh, 20 of, and um, I could just ramble on for a bunch of things. And I'd rather you ask me some questions and we can get to um, your answers. How's that? I know I mumble and I talk fast, so let me, I'll repeat anything I said. So. 
Kathy, anything from Zoom? Oh, come on, Zoom people. <laughs> Is this one working? Yeah. It is? Oh, he hasn't turned it. One minute. <laughs> yes, he's, he's fixing them. Now? Okay. Hi, Michael. Um, it's my understanding that the Army Reserve property and coming available is Champlain Housing Trust thinking about what they might offer to do on that property? The Armory and Winooski? I thought it was larger than that. That may be. I thought it was, an, it was the National Guard site. Am I? National Guard, I think, controls the Armory and Winooski. It's not that whole National Guard site that's behind St. Michael's. Ah, uh, then I misunderstood. Well, it's okay. Uh, but, it's, but we are working with the city of Winooski. Um, it has to be put through a certain process for sale. It's going to be demolished. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Before you demolish a building nowadays, you have to go through a whole process. You just can't tear it down. Um, it has to go through that process, and then it becomes available as a request for proposals from the public. We're working, we, we've made, uh, uh, we being uh, us, working with the city of Winooski, have asked the governor and the legislature, would you give us a right to purchase the property, first right of refusal, so that we could then redevelop the property for a uh, range of affordable housing options. Uh, so we are engaged in that. That's going to be another year or two process before we get to the end of that one. Hi, I'm seeking to understand uh, the in, in input if, of monies from, say, Section 8 or from paid employment that residents might be able to proffer to to pay, I'm, I, I don't understand how much of this uh, Champlain Housing Trust is supplying, it's just ignorance on my part, is supplying the, the wherewithal to live in these units or whether it, residents have to, especially in, in rental units, have to come up with money by applying through Section 8 and public monies. That's good, good question. Um, of those, Can I move this again? Of those 1,700 or so apartments, which I described, um, probably about a little less than 50% might be people who hold Section 8 vouchers. Okay, uh, Our apartments are still $1,100 for one bedroom, are still $800 less than the market. Okay, And so for somebody who's earning 70% or 80% of median income, it works for them. If somebody's making 30% of median income or is on Social Security or disability, they can't afford our apartments. We then work with the local housing authorities to ensure that those folks get vouchers so they can come into our apartments. So it's, it's a conversation and a, and a sort of a, a work uh, with the individuals as they come in. We encourage people who are making a certain income who might be disabled, you know, might not have enough money to be able to afford even the affordable apartments that we have to work with the local housing authorities, Winooski, Burlington Housing Authority, State Housing Authority. When we're working with homeless population folks who have zero money, we are usually designated units and usually have the housing authority willingness to provide the individuals going into those homeless units because they're part of a system, a coordinated entry system. They automatically get a voucher when they come into our housing. So it's it's a not that complex, but it basically the, the answer is we use our tenants use vouchers as well uh, when they're only making a thousand dollars a month. They can't afford a thousand dollars of rent. Uh, so we do we do a combination of both things. I'm just amazed at the number of new apartments going up over here off Market Street in South Burlington. You talked about the ones off North Avenue. The population is not growing to the extent of the number of apartments going up. Is this really due to Airbnbs? And if so, are we doing anything to take some of those Airbnbs off the Airbnb list and making them back into housing? Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a complicated question. Um, 
I would say that um, there has been some population growth. Even Burlington had a 10% growth between you know, over 10 years, which is not a lot if you're from if you're in Arizona, <laughs> you know, or somewhere like that. But it is still more than Burlington has had for a while. Um, and uh, two things are happening. Uh, one is is that the size of households is smaller, so you need more units in order to deal with the number of folks who need housing. At the same time, also, actually, it's, uh, some of the new immigrant families are much larger. We actually had to build three and four bedroom units as well, here and there, and then not in existence as well. So the, I, I guess the, the point is that the number of housing units is not direct correlation to population, because the population use of the housing has changed. Um, in terms of Airbnbs, Burlington has begun to regulate it. Winooski is looking to regulate it. South Burlington is beginning to look at regulating it. Uh, and Burlington, I think the regulation has had some impact. It's also charging people now for their use of their Airbnb program, and that has generated a million dollars plus or so for affordable housing programs in the city. So even though it might not be, you, you, uh, you may not may get those units back uh, to be in the regular marketplace, but at least the money is coming back to be able to build more affordable housing. And that seems to, to me that's a a decent formula uh, and a way of dealing with it. But that's, um, in part, you see um, more hotels being built, in part because the motels, uh, the motels are sort of not in favor as much as they used to be. Uh, and then also there's been a slight impact in terms of Airbnbs. And so the hotel market is uh, growing, or opportunity for a market is growing. Who else has questions? Oh, oh good. Um, talk about senior housing, please. Uh -huh. Well, <laughs> we have some seniors in our housing. Uh, we do. Um, and if I, if I showed you uh, the slide, can I, I can't go back, can I? Oh, look at that. Oh, I'm, going, I'm going the wrong way. Um, and we look at some of these sort of uh, programs and opportunities. Often enough, we are finding ourselves working closely with Cathedral Square. I went by it. Um, and um, there. Uh, we're working closely with Cathedral Square as a partner. So we've done. Four different kinds of developments with Cathedral Square, meaning where we've gone in and they have gone in and built senior housing, we have built regular affordable rental housing for multifamily housing. And so we do a partnership with them. They don't build as much senior housing um, that they want to build. We don't, we feel the same way. Um, they, they are less aggressive. They, um, in, uh, uh, they, they do a lot of service programs, which have been great. Um, we do a wider range of things in terms of homelessness and home ownership as well. Um, so in terms of senior housing, they are our partner, although we, 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 clear, we don't have a restriction. You know, um, as, as a matter of fact, every once in a while I suggest to a tenant maybe they want to be in senior housing um, because they want to be closer to a family in Milton. There's one family and lives on North Avenue, writes me every year a nice postcard saying, our family lives in Milton, would you build housing there? And I say, you know, no, we can't right now, but you could talk to Cathedral Square and they say, we don't want to live with Cathedral Square, we want to live with you. That's great, but I think that we always encourage people to go to Cathedral Square at some level. I actually have staff uh, who live in a Cathedral Square housing <laughs> uh, who are older, so. Here's another one. Do you work with the USCRI Refugee Agency? Oh, yeah. Uh, we do. Uh, we work with uh, AALV, which is in the Old North End Community Center. There are, they are actually, that's how we got to the Old North End Community Center, is when Jacob, who is a director of that, called up and said, you need to buy this building <laughs> uh, so that we could stay here because it was for sale in the market and they might have been displaced. So Jacob actually called up and, and uh, I could do an imitation of him, but I won't. But it basically it was, you need to come here, buy this building, so that we can have our programs here and other people can have programs here. So we work closely with them. And we work closely with USCRI, um, mainly in the early stages, because USCRI steps back after um, nine months or a year. Um, but we have been quietly housing USCRI refugees 
um, in about three different properties now. Uh, the Ho Hum Motel, which I mentioned, which I showed you a photo of, that was we house USCRI uh, families there. Uh, in between, uh, I know it sounds kind of funny, but um, uh, after we shut down one program, which was the the uh, COVID isolation facility, and before we turned it into the rental apartments, we had a sp we had about six months of the place being empty. We didn't want it to be empty, and we rented it fairly inexpensively. USCRI, we did that. At we, right now, we're doing that in Shelburne as well. And we did that at the Zephyr, uh, Zephyr place, which is the hotel in Williston, where the building, we bought the building. It was vacant for three, four, six months, and we housed refugees, uh, families, uh, short term. So that's how we've been working with USCRI principally. They would like to be in the O'Brien Community Center. I'm not sure if we have enough space for them. So um, we do talk, chat with them. There's kind of an addition by the same person. Uh, are, are there any complications of finding housing for refugees? Um, you going to answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that the issue is not so much, uh, I, I don't think it's easy. Um, I'm going to say that. I can't really, I'm not an expert on this one. Um, but I would say that it's harder because the families are larger. And it's difficult to find those places. We've actually, at times, combined units to make a, an apartment big enough. I mean, I, my grandmother had 10 kids. They had, we had two kitchens. <laughs> so combining two apartments made total sense to me, because um, that's what you need when you have 10 kids. Um, you need two kitchens. Um, so I think that that was, um, I think that's one of the principal issues that um, refugee families are finding. The second part is, is that um, they are finding themselves displaced because they principally are low income. And we could talk about um, a situation with Nuski that's going on right now where over about 20 families are being displaced and in part because of their status um, as refugees. Uh, um, at least some of us will think that um, because they, are, they present themselves very differently uh, culturally. And that's often difficult for some property owners to work through. Um, so, and will the neighborhood, will, will the proposed neighborhood code in Burlington help housing availability or affordability? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to. Uh, uh, well, I think the intention is that it helps to build more housing. I think the belief is you build more housing, um, then, then therefore then it's more affordable housing. I'm not sure if I believe that completely, okay? Um, I don't think if you build, I think if you build more housing, you are certainly serving the market and it's better, okay? Certainly for middle income people and for upper middle income people, the more housing that's being built, the better it is and that relieves some pressure on the market. So there's no doubt that happens. But if you build a housing development that has 100 units and the, and they, and the rental numbers are 4,000 per month or 5,000 per month and higher, it doesn't, uh, I've always looked like this, this is an Italian phrase <laughs> for, nah, doesn't do it, you know? So you really need to have a focus on building affordable housing. Now, I also say that I know the code on a particular property we're looking at, we're working with the families who do, uh, who are concerned about their disabled adult children um, on, on a building a certain kind of housing. We have a property on St. Paul Street. And that new zoning is actually going to help us make that property uh, better. So specific, in specific instances, yes. Uh, overall, eh, kind of, maybe, not really, you know, not always. It can uh, not necessarily have a, the, the impact. Building, being able to build more housing doesn't necessarily translate into more affordable housing uh, by, in and of itself. Two, two questions. Uh, one is that... By the way, I could do this all day. I have nowhere to go. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, we've still got five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, probably 35 years ago, market rents in Burlington were the second highest in New England. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd like to, ha ha if you know, uh, and that was second to Boston. So I'd like to know if, if you know what that status is. And then my second question is, uh, if we were to take the status quo right now and assume that 4 to 5% vacancy rate is what's good for a healthy market, 
How many units would still need to be built aside from the ones that are being built now? Uh, I, you know, I do, I do spreadsheets, so I'm trying to look at the spreadsheet in my brain to sort of see if I can figure that out. Uh, I, I, w I can't tell you precisely where we are in terms of the market in New England. I know when I tell people that our rents at market rents are 2000 2400 they go like that from other parts of the country, thinking that Vermont would be inexpensive and cheap. Uh, we all know it's not. Uh, and so therefore then when I tell people that, it, I think it turns out to be true. Um, we are highest rents in the state of Vermont. We're probably higher than most places in New Hampshire, probably more than most places in Maine, maybe Portland. I would say we're probably equal to a couple of places, you know, some parts of Boston. Um, after that, I think we're probably a higher, higher rent overall. So I'm not sure if that has changed. Look, we, um, many, maybe many of you were born here. Many of us came here. We came here because it's a great place to live. That has not sort of helped. Okay, uh, you know what I mean? Um, people are not going to Plattsburgh. I hope nobody's from Plattsburgh. People are not going to Plattsburgh because it's not a great place to live. Rents are really inexpensive there. Uh, so, so our success is based upon the fact that, in fact, people want to live here. And, and so we have to live with that and try to work through that. And that's true of all those other markets. Parts of Boston, parts of Portland, parts of other places. So it's not something we should feel bad about as much as we have to work through. If the vacancy rate is higher, rents would change. Okay, rents would adjust. Because people would have to compete. Time for one more question. So, from your, your description, then you are primarily a um, landlord uh, sort mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. But I also do some things with Harbor Place and know that there, and also over at um, the place on Susie Wilson Road, mm -hmm. that you are helping to include a food bank within yes. this. Is this something that you envision continuing? Yes. Actually, we have two. We have a, 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 a food, food now at Harbor Place and food, and we have an art program at Harbor Place, which is now a motel operated uh, pretty much exclusively for folks who are homeless. And also it's Zephyr, uh, excuse me, Susan's Place, which is now um, uh, just for folks who are homeless, coming out of homelessness, 76 units. And we had to build a, uh, a food uh, pantry there. Um, we see more of that. Um, one of the people in resident services, actually a few people in resident services, are there to do community building. That's their job. Community building tends to be uh, coffee and ice cream socials. Um, it's responding to basic needs like, please build us a fence so the kids don't run into the road. And it includes meeting sort of the needs of the community in, in different ways like, like art programs and other kinds of social programs that build spirit and and uh, you know, build character in people. Uh, so we do arrange that we have people who do that. Resident Services Department has grown to do those kinds of things. We think it's essential. Something I've been wanting to do for, for a while, and I think we now have the capacity to do more of that. So thank you for that question. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you.